the abomination of desolation, past, present, and future. So, now first let's start with a popular belief, which I'm sure you've all heard. Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Now, my Western Civ professor was an Aussie, and he pronounced it Antiochus Epiphanes. But no, it's Antiochus Epiphanes. I'm not an Aussie, so there. So what he did, he sacrificed a pig on the altar, 167 B.C. Now, that's the popular wisdom that that's what it's talking about. All right. Problem with that. Now, the, what, that was an abomination, right? No question about it. But the one that Daniel the prophet talked about, that Jesus talked about, had not yet happened when Jesus was on this earth. Now, how do we know that? Because he said, he described it as being in the future. Here's what he said. When ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoke of it by Daniel the prophet, stand on the holy place, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. That's still in the future. Mm-hmm. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes was uh, in the 2nd century B.C. Therefore, that could not be the one that Jesus was talking about. How far in the future did Jesus say it would occur? This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, for it witness to all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye see the abomination. So after the gospel is preached to all the world, then comes the abomination Jesus is talking about. So Jesus said it would happen after the gospel preached to all the world. Now, Matthew 24, this might surprise some people, but it's in the Bible, 14 was fulfilled before the destruction of the temple. The apostle tells us that uh, the gospel which he heard, which was preached to, what does it say? Every creature, every person, right? Every creature. Yeah, every creature. Even more than a person. Uh, apparently in the known world at the time, so that was fulfilled. It's called a dual application prophecy. Mm-hmm. And Paul wrote this in 62 AD. And the abomination of desolation followed in 66 AD. Now, what happened? The first siege of Jerusalem, and we'll talk about later. Mm-hmm. And after that, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So, one, two, three, sequence. Matthew 24 is recognized as a dual application prophecy. The first application is the destruction of the temple. A.D. 70, that has happened. Second application is the end of the world, which still hasn't happened because we're still here. Mm-hmm. Matthew 24, 14 will be, will be fulfilled again before Christ's return. The abomination of desolation will follow, then the end of the world. Okay, so that's the sequence. Now, as far as that second final fulfillment, again, the popular belief. A third temple will be built and desecrated in the middle of the 70th week by the man of sin. You've all heard that, right? And here's the depiction of what could be the third temple. And as I understand, they've already stockpiled the uh, building supplies and materials to build that. Problem with the theory. Number one, the old covenant and the earthly temple and services under it have been abolished a third temple would not be a holy place which could be defiled. That's the reality. Yeah. Number two, Christ's kingdom is no longer earthly. We have here no continuing city. This people are believers of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. So while the third temple may or may not be built, it will not have the spiritual significance of God's temple in the Bible. Third, There's no exegetical precedent for splitting off the 70th week in Daniel 9 and placing it at the end of time. The 70 weeks prophecy of the Messiah was fulfilled and completed in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Separate topic, we have studied that before, we can review it again. Now we get to the great prophecy of Daniel chapter 11. There's a lot of reading, I hope my voice holds up. Now, the prophecy in Daniel 11 provides clues about the abomination of desolation. It extends from Daniel's day to the end of time, 2,500 years of history. First, the historical survey, which is the prophecy itself. You have the key players, which are the king of the north and the king of the south. Now, what's the origin of these terms? 
Well, it originated back in the land of Palestine. Guess who was a king of the north from that map? Could you guess? Aram. Syria. A militaristic power. Came down from the north and attacked Israel. And guess who the king of the south was? Egypt. All right. They're in the south and the north. That's why the king of the north, the king of the south. Now, as a prophecy continues, uh, these players change identity. The king of the north becomes a Seleucid kings, then imperial Rome, then papal Rome. King of the south becomes the Ptolemaic kings, Islam, and finally secularism, opposed to Christianity. Let's look at the prophecy itself. Fine print. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I'll try to wade through it. <clears throat> now then I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he'll stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his umpire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. He will not go to the, his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his umpire will be uprooted and given to others. The king of the south will become strong, and one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they'll become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He'll attack the forces of the king of the north and enter the fortress. He'll fight against them and be victorious. He will seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt, which is the place of the king of the south. For seven years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south and will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Now, all these are historical events. I'm going to just identify a few of them here as uh, place markers. So the fourth king of Persia was Xerxes, the Great. All right. And this is a last relief of Xerxes the Great. And then the mighty king who would arise, who would challenge Xerxes, was Alexander. Okay. Brilliant general. And guess what happened to Alexander? He drank himself to death. Probably was also poisoned because he just had a big fight with his, his best friend and a general. And he uh, stabbed his friend general to death. So he probably was poisoned as well. But, so, what happened was that he had a son, but it was a pretty weak character, and he was removed. And guess who divided up Alexander's kingdom? The four main generals. All right. So, they took over different areas. We had the north, the Seleucus was one. Ptolemy, another general on the south in Egypt. And the Lysimachus and Cassander and so forth. All right. Now, that's where you get the story we just saw here. So the king of the south, Ptolemy, will become strong, and one of his commanders became stronger and so forth. This is Ptolemy, uh, General Ptolemy. Okay. And then he went against the king of the north, which is another general, Seleucus, and this is Seleucus here. What's going to happen is the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army. It will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride, will slaughter many thousands, but will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first. After several years, he'll advance with a huge army fully equipped. This, again, is the Seleucid um, dynasty there. Then the king of the north will come and build up siege ramps. Now, that's Antiochus III. Okay. And will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land, which is Judea. Okay. 
and will have the power to destroy it. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. He'll give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he'll turn his attention to the coastlands, and will take many of them, but a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him, and that is Lucius Cornelius Scipio, a Roman general, 190 B.C. After this, he'll return back to the fortress of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. That's the end of Seleucid power. And here we see a transition because we see the end no more. How do we know there's a transition? Because he says he'll be seen no more. That's the end. Yeah. So someone now is going to take his place and guess who that is? The victor, which is Imperial Rome. Uh, Rome conquered Greece in roughly 168 uh, B.C. and so forth, uh, finally, and annexed Macedonia. Now his successor will send out a tax collector, and so this is Rome, and guess who they sent out? A guy named Pompey uh, to maintain the royal splendor. And he went to Egypt and became enamored with Cleopatra. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, yet not in anger or in battle. Well, what happened? He was assassinated. And he was assassinated because uh, the... Uh, Powers that be at the time thought that Caesar, who was going to chase Pompey to Egypt, would be pleased. Mm -hmm. So here we see uh, the delegation from uh, Egypt presenting Pompey's head to Caesar. And Caesar was aghast. He, he was disgusted. But uh, that's how the end of Pompey came. Okay. Now, he'll be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not been given the honor of royalty. So this actually is Julius Caesar who succeeded Pompey and became a consul and so forth and eventually elevated himself to be emperor and deity. Now this is the man himself, Julius Caesar. Okay. So also it's a non-dynastic transition because it says not given the honor of royalty. So this was, uh, he came from an illustrious background but he wasn't certainly a, uh, part of the uh, formal line there. Right. Now, so what happened? How does Caesar come to power? It says that uh, he will seize you through intrigue, the kingdom when the people felt secure. So the Roman Senate has set a line in the sand, which is the Rubicon River. And guess what Caesar did? He crossed the Rubicon. Veni, vidi, vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. <laughs> mm. All right. So then he swept away the uh, defenders sent by the Senate. And under the uh, imperial Roman power, says a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. That was Jesus Christ, who was uh, put to death, uh, certainly by the Romans. And after coming to agreement with him, he'll act as chiefly. And this is very interesting. Uh, with only a few people who rise to power. Now, this is another transition. He'll rise to power. This is not Caesar. Caesar was assassinated in 44 B.C., roughly, something like that. Uh, so then who succeeded there? Okay. Well, in the first place, this covers hundreds of years of time. So Rome continued, first with Augustus and then Claudius and all these various ones until we get to another emperor who uh, had to make an agreement. Let's talk about an agreement here. So what happened is that Constantine inherited Diocletian's empire racked by religious war. The huge threat to the empire was the Goths coming down from the north. So Constantine said, come on, guys, let's deal with the religious issue so we can focus on the real threat to the empire. And they got an agreement between the pagan Roman religion of Jupiter and the Christians. That's the agreement. Now, the power of the church slowly uh, got greater. This is Constantine, by the way. Oddly enough, he's holding a Gothic sword. It's not a Roman sword, but oh well, what can I say? So here we have a transition again because now he comes to power with a few people. 
Now, first of all, the transition comes after Constantine because there is another a century of Roman emperors. But the transition is, so a few people come to power. How do we know it? Because the Goths sacked Rome, deposed, and executed the last Roman emperor. Uh, this is the Goths sacking Rome, and this is the emperor, Romulus Augustulus, being taken prisoner and executed. <clears throat> so, therefore, now the question is, no more emperor. Who took over? Notice this historian. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see, that is the Bishop of Rome, the, the Pope. Inevitably, it resulted a position not only new, but very different from the former. So therefore, the uh, Bishop of Rome took the place eventually of the Caesars. It was formalized in 534 AD with the Code Justinian and eventually was uh, secured in 538. The Pope replaced the Emperor. Papal Rome now becomes the King of the North. This is the final transition. Papal Rome remains King of the North to the end of the prophecy. So, now we come to what's called as the little horn. It said, a few people he rose to power. This is described in Daniel 7 as this little horn that became started tiny, but grew up to be tremendously powerful. So, this is a little horn there. Um, the Pope, with the, with the eyes and the mouth speaking pompous things. Little horn that became great. When the rest of provinces will feel secure, he'll invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. He'll distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. What happened was that uh, the Bishop of Rome would uh, distribute bishoprics for a price. And if you pay X number of dollars, or not dollars, but you know whatever the Italian uh, um, money was at the time, uh, you can actually become a bishop and so forth. Now, with a large army, he'll stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. So here we have the first crusade, which was called because the knights got their entertainment by killing peasants. And that pope decided, get these guys out of Europe somewhere where they can be killed off, you know, in this holy, quote, holy crusade. Now, the king of the south here is Islam. So, therefore, you have uh, the first crusade, which was fairly successful, followed by the second, followed by the third. And then we're going to follow this uh, with the intrigue that I'm not going to get into here. It's not that relevant to our, st our story today. But the king of the north will return to his own country, that is to Western Europe, with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant, which is John 3.16. In other words... Uh, Whoever believes in him shall not perish. Now, what happened was with the established church, they created all this framework of things you have to do to get to heaven. Not merely believe, you've got to do penance, uh, you've got to do confessional, etc., 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 and there's, there's a purgatory. So, the, as you do more good works, you spend less time in purgatory. It's called indulgences, right? So that's the war against the Holy Covenant there. So their, their focus for some time was the Crusades, but they came back from that. Now we're going to, come on, you guys, you have to do this and this. You've got to pay your money. Uh, you can be loyal to the church and so forth. That's the war against the Holy Covenant. And this is specifically the Roman Catholic Church? Yes. This is, this is, the, this is the King of the North, which is he always here, is the Papal Rome. Okay, so... At the point in time he'll invade the south again, this is the fourth crusade, 1202 AD. This time it will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him. That was actually in Venice, where they had a contract to build a huge number of ships. It didn't turn out that way, and the Venetians were not pleased, and therefore the crusaders ended up going to Constantinople to sack Constantinople to raise money to pay the Venetians. Okay. So, again, he turns back and he said, where's his fury against the Holy Covenant? He'll show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. The armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress. Now, this is an important distinction here. The temple, temple. Okay, now, the temple was destroyed in what year? 
AD 70. There's no temple, right? No, no literal temple right now. So we know that it can't be that. But think about what the uh, New Testament tells us about the temple under the New Covenant. Remember, when the Old Covenant came to an end, the temple services were abolished. But there's still a temple. What is the temple now? In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, whom ye are builded together. The foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ at the chief cornerstone. Mm -hmm. So the temple is now the spiritual temple. And the war being waged is, is, is against the dissenters who will not support the established church. Therefore, his wrath against those who support the Holy Covenant. It's that easy. Believe on Jesus and you'll be saved. This week, I took our Steps to Life little handout there and shared it with a uh, guy named Hugo and lives in Hamilton. And he sat on his porch and listened to it. He said, those are beautiful words, he said. I said, well, tell me, uh, what, uh, what stands in the way of you taking that step? You know what he said? The man in the mirror himself. I said, so tell me, think about it, Hugo. You said, it's always in the back of your mind. But, you know, none of us can guarantee tomorrow. Um, I've had friends who, I, I knew of a farmer, a big, burly Scandinavian farmer, on a hot day in uh, Iowa, and he jumped in a pond and died instantly because his heart stopped. You never know what can happen. So I said, this should not just be in the back of the mind, this should be front and center. What would it take, Hugo, for you to consider that next step, to accept the gift, the offer that's made to you? So you say, don't think about it and get back to me. So anyway, it's that simple. Salvation is very simple. You see your need of a savior, you turn away from the darkness, you, you repent, it's called. You turn toward the light, uh, you as, accept the gift that's offered, that Jesus paid the price for your sins. Uh, you accept the gift that he'll create a new life within you, and it's bam, 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 bam. It may be hard to accept, but the process itself is simple. So the church made it very complex, and the church made it based on merit, on your merit. Okay. So let's compare the old versus the new covenant. Under the old covenant, Exodus 19, 3 to 8, literal Israel, literal temple, and literal abomination uh, this happened in A.D. 66. New Covenant, John 3, spiritual Israel, spiritual temple, spiritual abomination. Make sense so far? No, there's a lot of stuff here. So, so God's church, his people, is the temple now. Now it says that he would abolish the daily sacrifice and set up the abomination that causes desolation which is the interposition of human authority between the soul and God. Mm. And even such a simple thing as where to attend a fellowship or a church. If someone says to you, you can't go to that church, that is standing in God's place. That's interposing human authority between the soul and God. Well, they did it big time. Now, let's see some of the things he did. First of all, the submission to the church, to the, the king of the north, is mandatory. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature submit to the Roman pontiff. That's human authority between the soul and God. All right. Now, they, now this is what was all involved there in doing that. The Bible is banned by church council. Salvation by works, doing meritorious good works. Mm -hmm. Confessional, penance, indulgence, church hierarchy, and infallibility. In the current catechism, you're told that uh, loyal Catholics should, um, what's the word they use? Uh, be, not supinely, but basically passively submit to the teachings of the church. Accept it. You don't challenge it. Because they have ex cathedra, they're talking with uh, infallibility. And that's to be a good Catholic. One reason I can never be a Catholic, by the way. But, anyway... So all these things happen. The Bible's banned. Church authority interposed between the soul and God. Those who are wise will instruct many. Now that's the Protestant Reformation. And guess what happened to the, those who followed the Reformers? It says, that, well, here's Luther, by the way. So at the Diet of Worms. Here I stand, I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. Now, they were persecuted. 
It says they will be uh, fall by the sword or burned or captured, and that's exactly what happened for hundreds of years. All right. So <coughs> those who were wise did their instruction. Those who followed them were persecuted, exactly like it says there. Meanwhile, the king of the north, that's the Roman papacy, will do as he pleases. He'll exalt and magnify himself above every god. Now that is a blasphemous reign of the papacy described in Daniel 7. And this is at the height of the papal power, Pope Innocent III. And here's a picture of him with his coat of arms. So he actually is claimed to stand in the place of God. There's many uh, references to that. He exalted himself above, above them all and talks about uh, that he's no regard for the one desired by women. That is, uh, the, 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 the uh, priests take a vow of celibacy. So, so therefore, no marriage, anything like that. And then he'll honor with gold and silver, precious stones, costly gifts. Attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign god, which is Satan, obviously. <clears throat> and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him, make them rulers, again, the bishoprics and so forth. So, now we come to the time of the end. The king of the south will engage him in battle. And this is secularism, power as opposed to Christianity. The time of the end means the time we're in now. So, Revelation 13, 11 to 17, the mark of the beast, I call it the last crusade. The second beast supports the holy war of the first beast. We'll get into more detail in a few minutes on that. So, I send this power over many countries, uh, so we'll get control of the treasures of gold and silver. But, uh, reports from the east, the kings of the east, Revelation 16, 12, which is uh, God and the forces of heaven, uh, Christ Opposing him, he'll go out in, out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. That is compelling to worship uh, the beast power, or the king of the north. Death decree and mark of the beast. And in the end, the armies of heaven will conquer and overcome, be victorious. So armies of heaven prevail. So that's the history, a brief snapshot of 2,500 years of history. Now, that's just the background. Now we come to the application. Fulfillment. First century fulfillment. Remember Jesus said, when you see the abomination stand in the holy place, let them in Judea flee to the mountains. First Jewish result, revolt A.D. 66. Cestius Gallus besieges Jerusalem and plants imperial standards on the Temple Mount, uh, the Jews considered the entire Temple Mount as holy ground. Now, we know it wasn't the holy place in the Temple because they would have to take the Temple. That didn't happen until later. But the point is that this was a sign for the believers to flee Jerusalem. That's what Jesus said, when you see it, then let he was on the rooftop. Go, don't worry about taking it, just get out of there. Now, here's a commentary on this. When this signal was given, let it be taken notice of and observed. Let them that are in the city of Jerusalem depart out of it, or who are in any other parts of Judea, in any of the towns or cities thereof, let them not betake themselves to Jerusalem, imagining that they may be safe there. It is a strong and fortified a place, but let them flee elsewhere. Accordingly, it is observed that many did flee about this time, which was marked by several interpreters, and which Josephus takes notice of a surprise that Septius Gallus, having advanced with his army to Jerusalem and besieged it on a sudden, without any cause, raised the siege, and withdrew his army when the city might have been easily taken. By which means, a signal was made, an opportunity for the Christians to make their escape. They accordingly did and went over Jordan, as Eusebius says, to a place called Pella. So that when Titus came a few months after, there was not a Christian in the city, because they had fled. So this is the first abomination of desolation. Exactly fulfilled as Jesus said. So the actor, the king of the north, imperial Rome, human authority tramples on holy ground. Medieval fulfillment. You know, we just saw that a few minutes ago. You got to submit to the Roman pontiff. And all these, the Bible ban, salvation by works, etc. 
Again, human authority tramples on holy ground. End time fulfillment, the last crusade. How do we know there'll be an, how do we know there'll be an end time fulfillment? Because it says in the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle. So the time of the end. Contestants, king of the north is papal Rome. King of the south is secularism. Mm -hmm. The king of the north will rally the powers of Christendom to save Christian civilization from rampant secularism and national ruin. Therefore, you have the culture war, which we're in the middle of for the past X number of decades here, especially right now. So you have on the one hand this side, and the other hand this side. You have Christian nationalism. Okay. So therefore, we've got to save America, God and country. Now, I'm going to quote here a well-known exponent of this idea, which is Franklin Graham. Turning back to God is the only hope for a nation that's turned its back on God. Now everybody says, amen, amen, amen. Oh, not so fast. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's read what Frank the Graham has to say. This is last year. Our nation has turned its back on God. Politicians are looking for what people want and what culture wants instead of what God wants. We need to stand on the absolute authority of God's word. I believe the Bible to be the word of God. By turning our back on God, our nation is sliding further and further away from him. Instead of becoming a better country, we are becoming more violent, lawless, and godless. Our policies are failing. Our economy is struggling. Our country is in trouble. We need to take a hard look at God's laws and his standards. That's not what most people, most Americans want to hear. Violence is rampant in our streets. Gangs and thugs roam and kill, not only at night, but in broad daylight. Leftist radicals riot, burn police stations, and loot city blocks. Drug abuse has soared, with fentanyl founding its way into virtually every sector of society, infiltrating rural and metropolitan areas alike. Primary, secondary, and so-called higher education continue their assault on religious liberty, constantly seeking to remove any vestiges of faith, imposing their progressive values on even the youngest of children. Now, this is a call to arms for that group, right? All right. A nation that has, was founded and grounded on the Christian faith and virtues have rejected God and his laws, much like the Israelites turned from their devotion to God and embraced the worthless idols of other cultures. All the tumult and chaos we see in our nation and world today is a direct result of abandoning God's holy standards. He's talking about the Ten Commandments, which he goes and lists uh, in this very long article. When people cast aside God's laws and devise their own norms, the nation is in serious trouble. God's law is holy, never changing, and given in divine wisdom and non-negotiable truth. Any attempt by a culture to dictate ungodly standards will never work. The only alternative for those who have turned their backs on God is to turn to him in repentance and faith so their sins are forgiven. God's law is then written in their hearts so the commandments of God are no longer burdensome to keep. When people live in obedience to the commands and precepts of Scripture, God's blessings follow. When disobedience and disdain dominate a culture, the consequences are bitter. Quote, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. It's a matter of life and death. Isn't that a call to arms for Christian nationalism? Now, you know what he's talking about. It's a huge article, but he lists the Ten Commandments. So what they're saying is the Ten Commandments should be the law of the land. Does that sound good? Well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Hold on. There's more the rest of the story to come here. So, the special interest in the Sabbath commandment. Uh, again, from the same article. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. God created and the heavens and the earth in six days on the seventh day rest from his labor. Our modern day Sabbath, Sunday, should be a special time to worship, honor, and revere the Lord of the Sabbath. So that should be the law of the land, according to Franklin Graham. All right? Not right. Now, Project 2025, a, a guide. If, if the guy that wins in November is Republican, this is supposed to be a roadmap for him to follow. I quote, Sabbath rest. God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest until very recently the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by a moral and legal regulation of, that, of work on that day, which is 
Sunday, the first day of the week. Moreover, a shared day of off makes it possible for families and communities to enjoy time off together, rather than as atomized individuals, provide a healthier cadence of life for everyone. Unfortunately, that communal day of rest has eroded under the pressures of consumerism and secularism, especially for low-income workers. Now that's, again, the game plan for the next president. Got to start enforcing these things here. So I'm not looking at the merits today. Uh, there's very, various ideas about a Sabbath. The point is what they're trying to do. That's the issue here. Why the interest in a weekly Sabbath? Well, the interest has been stated pretty obvious. If the Sabbath is enforced by law, people will go to church instead of sports or entertainment events. And that's the reasoning there. And that will be good for America. That will promote spiritual renewal and the healing of America. So that's the logic behind it. Pope Francis speaks of this in his greatest city called Laudato Si. Uh, here is based in the U.S. Congress. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. The law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day so that your ox and your donkey may have rest, the son of your maidservant and the stranger may be refreshed. Rest opens our eyes to the larger picture, gives us renewed sensitivity to the rights of others. So the day of rest centered on the Eucharist, sheds this light on the whole week, motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. Now, doesn't all this sound beautiful? I mean, hey, you know, have a communal day of rest where we, where we build relationships and uh, focus on God and family and so forth. Tens of billions of people will love this. Okay. But others echo Franklin, Franklin Graham's sense of urgency. God has already kindled in our midst the unquenchable fires of coming economic disaster. As well as the collapse of the entire world economy and the palaces of the money exchangers will be consumed, all business operations will be in complete shambles. This is the price to be exacted from our nation for the refusal of our people to keep holy the Lord's Day and for failure of those in authority to enforce its strict observance. If we as a nation will escape the doldrums of increased trouble as God's hand rests heavily upon his people, Opposition to, opposition to Sunday nationally declared the Sabbath must cease. That means no relief from mounting economic disaster until the seventh day, that is Sunday, following six days of labor, strictly enforced by government decrees and action. So there's a chorus. So we need to do this to bring America back to God. With that background, let's look at Revelation chapter 13. I saw another second. I thought saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound has been healed. It performed great signs, even causing fire to come out from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image to the honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast, with the number of its name. Now, this lies ahead here. Okay. And in a previous study, we confirmed that the first beast of Revelation 13 is Papal Rome. Now in Daniel 11, we see that the king of the north is Papal Rome. Therefore, beast of Revelation 13 equals king of the north equals Papal Rome. Revelation 13 says that all the world will be compelled to submit to the beast. Therefore, all the world will be compelled to submit to Papal Rome. Revelation 13 says that everyone must accept the mark of authority of the beast. Therefore, everyone must accept the mark of authority of papal Rome. Now, this may sound shocking, but I'm just taking it as it appears. Okay. Now, what is this mark all about? The biblical word uh, is uh, karagma, which means badge of servitude or ownership. 
a brand put upon slaves signifies ownership and submission. And I have my sources there, the lexical sources. It's a mark of the church's authority and a submission to that authority. Now, is it a literal mark where you like put a brand on someone? Or is it symbolic? Well, symbolic beast. Is there any critter on this planet that has seven heads of ten horns and made up of four different critters? No, it's obviously symbolic. A symbolic image, symbolic name, symbolic number, symbolic theologically, symbolic mark. Forehead or hand? The forehead is where moral decisions are made. A person makes a conscious decision to believe and follow something. The hand is a symbol of action. Those who accept the mark in their hand do not believe in the mark, but accept it to survive. $64,000 question. It used to be a game show. <laughs> What's the mark of authority of papal Rome? Dun, 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 dun. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. The church is above the Bible. And Sunday sacredness, which we have created, is proof of that fact. Now, what do you think of them apples? Woo! But that fits well with the desire of Christian leaders to get people back in church on Sunday. By doing that, promote moral renewal and help save America. Uh, there's something called moral relativism. That is, I know of many Christians who are supporting a particular candidate for president, never mind who, but they're saying they hold their nose at his personal behavior, but he's a bust to get them where they want to go. It's called moral relativism. This is moral relativism. Well, if it would be a good result, we'll go along with it. We want a good result. But, 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 Houston, we have a problem. And what's the problem? Is it the identity of the Sabbath? No, it's not the identity of the Sabbath here. Compelling worship by force of law is anathema to God. I don't care what your belief is you're trying to enforce, it's anathema to God. That's the problem. It was also anathema to the founders of this country, unlike the revisionist historians want to claim. I quote, this is from January, January 19, 1829. Senate report on Sunday mails. All religious despotism commences by combination and influence. When that influence, and think combination, Christian nationalism, influence, begins to operate on the political institutions of a country, the civil power soon bends beneath it. The catastrophe of other nations furnishes an awful warning of the consequence. It's exactly what's happening right now. Worship be God according to one's conscience is holy ground. In the last crusade, the king of the north does what he did before. He tramples upon holy ground. The one world religion says, accept the mark of authority and live. If you refuse to accept our authority, you will die. But God promises that he'll take care of us if we stay faithful to him. He should dwell on high. His place of defense should be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. God will take care of you if you trust him and honor him. Him that honoreth me, I will honor, God says. What does Jesus say? Fear not them which kill the body, not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Lucifer, Satan, said to Jesus, all this I'll give you if you'll bow down and worship me. Today, if you submit to the state's authority, you will eat and drink and be safe. But you'll face the judgment of God. Jesus, Jesus said to Lucifer, Get thee hence, Satan. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, him only shall you serve. Will that be your decision on that day? Will you make your stand on the word of God? Amen. We say yes, yes, amen. Make your stand on the word of God. In the book of Daniel, an image was erected and all compelled to worship the image. 
In the book of Revelation, a spiritual image will be erected, all compelled to worship it. Will you remain faithful to Jesus regardless of the cost? Remember that the armies of heaven are on the way, and they will deliver you. Jesus will take you to that beautiful place he's prepared for you in heaven. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to be there when Jesus throws up at the door and says, Come, you blessed of my Father, and heard the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You want to be there, right? Don't you want to receive that crown of life placed upon your head? Jesus knocks the door of your heart today. Won't you say yes to him? Won't you say, yes, I choose Jesus no matter what it costs. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for your love for me. I want to follow Jesus all the way to the kingdom. Is that your sacred decision by God's grace? Amen. Praise God.